Welcome back to the Wrong Advice Podcast. I'm your host, John Picciuto, and I'm very excited to have the one and only Mr. Stefan Vanasco on the pod with us today. Stefan, how you doing, my friend? I'm good. How you doing? I'm um, doing great, man. Uh, it goes without saying that this is a, a, a full circle moment for me from a podcast perspective. I've got a few of your prints up on my wall and uh, just super uh, excited to have you on the podcast today. Um, if you can give a uh, brief introduction to who you are for the listeners. Sure. Uh, Stefan Vanasco, New York born, LA raised photographer. i uh, been doing photography for about a uh, little over 20 years now. Um, love all forms of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's always, it's always hard trying to give the elevator picture yourself, <laughs> but you know, in, in a nutshell that that's the surface level of who I am. So I love that. Um, I've been a, a fan of your work for quite some time. And one of the things that I always come back to is that you've had sort of a very multifaceted career, right? You started in the adult film industry and in skateboarding videos and photography and have m- moved into sort of this like fine art street documentary style photographer. Um, you, you've kind of had your hand in a number of different uh, lanes, so to speak. Um, as your career kind of moved and evolved over the course of the last 20 years, um, what was it about the projects that you did that attracted you to them? And then what sort of projects do you see yourself kind of moving into uh, at this point in your career? Um, so, so you're curious about like the, the projects that I was doing prior, like what attracted me to them? Yeah, yeah. Like so starting off, you know, I, I'm only a couple years into this game. I'm pretty much taking every job that someone calls me or, or asks me to do. Yeah. Um, well, well, I mean, you know, to, to kind of pick it up. So I, I learned photography through the adult industry just by like a chance opportunity. I kind of felt like at a certain point towards my late twenties that I had reached like as far as I could go in that world. Um, so mentally I was ready to move on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, over that time frame, like photography kind of started out as an interest in a job perspective. Um, but over that time I started taking, um, my camera with me Mm -hmm. just out to document, you know, not even document just to go make photos of like my friends skateboarding and traveling and like all this different stuff. And over that time I realized like photography turned into, um, this passion, like the second wind passion of like in my life. And I can equate that the first one was being 12 years old, 13 years old and like, skateboarding and like what that did for my life and what it changed and just the feeling it gave me. So it was the same exact thing. Um, so yeah, I just had a, an exit from the adult world and was just like, Oh, like, let me see where this takes me. Like, I feel like I'm having so much fun and I love what I'm doing with this that I don't want to be 60 and question like, what if, like, what could have happened if I followed it just to see where it went? Um, for the most part, I think because of my skateboarding background, I had a lot of fortunate project opportunities come my way. I mean, definitely like the first guys to give me a, a, a proper shot with something, I would say was probably um, the Skate Mafia guys. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a board with like Asa Akira for them and like they were really cool to work with on that. Um, you know, I got to do stuff with like LRG to create some uh, some ad campaigns for them for like Bader Magazine and Double XL. So, just by the good fortune of me making my photos and sharing them, and just that tight knit, you know, foundation of skateboarding, like I just had a re- lot of really cool opportunities keep popping up, like as time went on. And my my whole mentality of it though was really just if I can get by doing what I love doing, then that to me would be winning. So as far as the projects, I just, you know, again, it was just kind of like projects that came up that I was like really hyped to be a part of because of the people and the companies involved and that, yeah, that, that's where I kind of springboarded from. That's awesome. I also, uh, you and I had a conversation a a few years on Twitter, uh, you know, a few years ago on Twitter where we were talking about, uh, how the film photo world has kind of uh, grown in the last couple of years from like an Instagram and a Twitter perspective and you're kind of 
framing of it was, you know, if you don't put that it was shot on film, would someone know? Um, you as a photographer shoot a ton of film. You work in a lot of different mediums, obviously, digital and film. Um, I'm curious of what your thought process is on the sort of film revival and the cult that is film photography nowadays on, you know, hashtag film and, and uh, the film landscape on Instagram and, and uh, on social media. Um, I think it's great. And I totally get it. I think it's a lot of a, it's like, it's like a bunch of people from a generation that grew up purely digital, especially with pictures. So the idea of being more a part of your photo, like whether it's you're making the picture, you're developing it at home and you're scanning it. Like there's a lot of steps that make you feel more involved with the photograph. Um, I, I do think it's great. I do. I, I think it's great. As long as photography has lots of mediums for people to work with, I think that's amazing. But at the same time, I, I will say that it feels more like a crutch. I don't think like as a viewer, when I look at people's photographs, like I don't need to be bombarded with what it is. Like, let me take it in and like just accept it for what it is. Um, I think the idea of film is really a preference to the creator. I think the audience, as long as your photograph and the message within that photograph can be translated and resonated digital or film at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. That's been my take and my experience. Yeah. Um, I, as far as like people liking my photos or resharing them or buying prints or buying whatever, I've never once had someone say, Oh, this isn't on film. I'm not buying it. Like, <laughs> or I've never had people say, Oh, this is on film. Like I'll pay five times more. So I think, that whole concept of one puts more value over the other is not necessarily like a fact. I think it's really just the creator's personal choice and how they want to like make their pictures. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, I, I shoot a lot of street and documentary uh, photography in and around New York city. And my go-to medium when I shoot street photography is usually film. I think from, uh, you know, kind of like a making a picture, making a photo, making a moment perspective, there is an intentionality behind shooting on film that does something for me differently than if I'm out uh, on the streets with a digital camera. And it's not to say that one is better than the other, but like for me personally, when I'm out there and I'm able to kind of slow things down and be a lot more, um, you know, content aware on what I'm producing, it just works better for me personally. Yeah, I mean, but that, but that, I think that mentality too, because like we've all been there, and I think it's also like it just comes down to your self control and your self discipline, like when shooting with digital. Um, and again, it, it, what you just stated kind of resonates back to it. it's all the the person who's making that work. It's like whatever inspires them, whatever makes them feel better. But I don't think it needs to be forcefully shoved or, or announced in everyone's faces. Um, and I will say this, it's like shot on film, it's great. Maybe you're sharing and that's the communal point of it, but it's also because it's on film doesn't make it any better of a photograph, like digital or film. If it's a shit photograph, it's a shit photograph. And I think <laughs> people need to like also step back and say, Oh, like, yeah, I made this on film, but like, is this a good picture on film or is it just another photograph on film? I think that's uh, the context people should have. Totally. I, I totally agree with you completely. Um, you're, you're a person who's got like a pretty significant social media following. And I'm very curious how um, the, the well, you, you have got a, for the context for the listeners, um, you own a skate company called Visual, um, which I would imagine is more along the lines of like your nine to five running that company, right? Is that correct? Yeah, for the most part, visuals has, has evolved into like an art project um, for me. So it's, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, da daily, that's like the first things I try to attend to. Then after that, it's like my own personal work and photography and stuff. So Right, cool. So for like, for argument's sake, you've got a, a large social media following. And I'm curious um, if you feel any pressure to create work centered around things that are going to resonate with your audience. Not at all. I think if you're putting the audience first, then like, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to think how to, how to phrase this. Um, I've never created things like with the audience for the most part, like first and foremost in mind. Mm -hmm. Like I always make stuff that I, that appeal to me that I like. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if you start catering to an audience, that's a very slippery slope. That's not good for any creative. Cause now you're going to start letting the audience dictate what you do and what you make. And that, that's just going to ruin you. That's why I always find it interesting when I see people asking, pulling the audience before they even do anything. Should I make this video? Should I do this? Should I, I do that? And it's like, how, like I always enjoyed the creators who just did what they wanted to do and put it out there. 
Like, you know, you don't need to like check and pull the audience for anything you want to, you want to create. I think just if it's speaking to you and it feels good to you, just fucking put it out. Like, oh. yeah, that, that, that's what I think they should do. I fucking love that. I also think that it's an interesting point because that bears in mind the question, or at least in my opinion, the adage between someone who's like a photographer and an artist versus someone who's like creating content. And I think, you know, maybe this is just like the old man fist in the sky, <laughs> me coming out here. But there's a difference between the people who are content creators who are creating a brand or a lifestyle around who they are versus a person who's like being intentional and creating art. Um, and I don't know if that's just me being kind of like a little negative Nancy or whatnot. Um, but I do think there is a bit of a distinction between someone who's a content creator and someone who's a photographer and an artist. Yeah, there, there, there definitely is. I'm trying to think if there's like people who like cross that line, but there's, I mean, there's people, it's like, you know, they have their outlets, whether, you know, they want to make um, YouTube videos per se, or mm -hmm. they want to make, you know, TikTok videos that are instructional and everything. And it's kind of like, you're more, you can be more content driven because at least my my take on that would be is like how do you have enough creative uh bandwidth in your head to like fulfill either or yeah like it's, how it's do you tough. go out and like commit time to be like a, like like with the intention of like like an artist and then how do you stop that and then now you shift gears into like okay now i'm going to make this instruction video of like how to color grade or like a review of this camera mm -hmm. like i feel like that is just it's just it's a lot. It's a lot of yeah. It's a lot of bandwidth for it's like to kind of put your mind into those two things, and it's kind of like how like one's gonna suffer the other. Totally. Like that's the way I would see it. Is and I think like, you know, you can make photographs that are cool, that they're general, and they're kind of like a you know um, aesthetically appealing, but there's nothing that's like kind of pushing volumes on like where your mind is or what you're doing. So oh. that that's my take on it. That it's kind of like it it. it it's it's a sacrifice for either or if you're trying to juggle both. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I completely agree. Um, I find that there are a few street photographers who I look up to and documentary style photographers who I look to up to uh, quite a bit. And, and obviously you fall within that category. You have what I would consider like a couple of the most iconic street photos that have been minted in like the last you know few years um comes to mind the couple on the subway which i uh the mta which i own a print of um there's the kid on the so uh, maybe in like the transit station with the sad balloon and then the other one where the kid's jumping over the puddle and there's just this incredible um reflection of like the cityscape in the puddle that the kid the child is jumping over um in your mind what makes for a great street photo and how do you go about composing and creating um these incredible images um i think well, well first off thank you for the kind words on those three photographs those are probably you know at least easily like a top three for me um i think all right, i'm gonna go first with the idea of like what makes a good street photograph and i think in my take it, it's it's a mixture of intentful use of your eye mixed with your camera like lens like comprehending your camera like all these things right you're not just like merely holding the camera like at a general level level you know level frame and making a photograph of like something right i think it's like there's a perspective or a take that that is part of the photographer involved within the photograph it's not just the, the camera doing the work mm -hmm. um i think it's that take and i think it's recognizing like like what's a genuine moment and what's 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 what I call Seinfeld photography, <laughs> which is which is photos of nothing. Yeah. Like, you know, what I'm saying like, and don't get me wrong, because a lot of it is going out to do street photograph. It's fucking tough. And it's like, you know, you got to be instinctual. You got to have an idea of kind of like what you're shooting. Um, but it's also this like trial and error. And it's kind of like the more effort, the more time you can put out into it, the more you know, the more, the more times you go fishing, the more fish you're going to catch. Mm -hmm. Like that's my take on street photography. So a lot of people can take their time and, you know, they shoot that. I, I don't know how many photos I've seen of just an average person walking across the street an average person, average person walking into a shadow, like all these shots that are just kind of like, they're, they're cool. But I could tell this is like, this is like you at the gym practicing. This isn't fucking like the fight. This isn't, Mm -hmm. the match like this is like you in training mode mm -hmm. so like a lot of these photographs like they're all relatively same and they're all there's nothing outstanding about them so i think 
if you're trying to shoot photography, you got to like step back and look at your work and say, is this really a photo of anything or am I trying to play it off that this is bigger than what it is? Mm. And, and, you know, Seinfeld photos, like they're fine. Like it's okay to say, Hey, like the, this photo really is of nothing, but there's something about it that attracts me. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's totally fine and acceptable, but I think like as photographers, we have to be our own worst critics and you have to say like, how many photos do I need of another guy walking across a wintry street in New York? That's like, <laughs> there's nothing unique about it. Like right. I have the same photo. 20 people made the same photo that day of another guy crossing the street. Like, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's my take on it. So yeah. part of it is, is being, you know, judgmental towards your own work and recognizing a genuine moment. So like for me, like those three photographs are all very unique moments. And, you know, they're all part of like a point of departure, like in the sense of like, I was following something that led me to the moment, like the kid oh, jumping over the pub in LA, like rainy day in LA going through, I wanted to go through that, that alley and that toy district alley. And, you know, so what originally grabbed me was, oh, like there's this cool, unique shaped reflection of the city. Like I'm going to shoot that because I was they're shooting that the kid walked by with his family and then he just starts jumping it back and forth. <laughs> and then when his parents were done, they, they left. So my point of departure of following these like reflection shots, shaped reflection shots through LA, like led me to that. The couple on the LIRR that morning, I went out to the Jamaica station and was like, you know, just shooting harsh light, contrasting shadows and shapes. I was really inspired. Um, the day before. So I, all I had was like my monochrome on me in a 50 and I was following that and like following that point of departure at that time led me to like, Oh, there's a couple embracing on this train. Like, Holy shit. This is a pretty, you know, unique moment for me to like photograph. Yeah. Um, you know, and the LA one was like a similar trope where I was downtown and was just like, Oh, I'm going to go up to Hollywood to go shoot. Jumped on the, uh, the train station, got off at K town for a little bit, then went back on the train station. There was this little boy with his dad and his brother, but the little boy just had this like weird long t-shirt on and the balloon and with a, with a sad face on it. Um, so it was kind of interesting that it wasn't like, I wasn't setting out to like look for those exact moments, but because I was busy doing other things throughout that day or shooting other things throughout that day, that those, they led me to those moments. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know. So for me now, it's like when I look at like, especially when I look at my own street photograph, it's like, okay, I've made these photographs. Like these are my pinnacles. Like, like what else is, is comes close to these so far that I've made. And there hasn't really been much because like, I just know how much time and effort it takes to like find yourself in moments of like those for photo, you know, to photograph. Like it's, it's very, it's very hard. Do you struggle with past success? So like you have obviously had a lengthy, um, you know, borderline, boring, incredible, wonderful career 20 years in. Do you struggle with past successes and like how it matches up to like what you're doing now and what you'll do in the future? Um, not really, not at all. Because I think if you put that pressure of like, if you keep looking back, it's like, how do you go forward if you keep looking back at what you did? Like, mm -hmm. That, that's my take on that is like, I don't want to keep looking back and say like, you know, like, Oh, like I shot this photograph or got this many likes at one point or got this. I, I, that's not now. And that's not the future. So I just kind of say my photography is going to keep evolving. So what I made during that time, that could have been a phase that could have been something I was like super heavy on. And now I'm, you know, like I'm shooting fucking, uh, you know, flowers, I'm shooting whatever the hell I want. And that's where my, my head's at today. So I think that's important is to never look back because, can't move forward when your head's turned around. Ooh, fuck. I'm writing that down. That's really good. Shit. <laughs> um, I, I'm very, obviously, you know, pretty green uh, when it comes to having uh, the moniker of photographer as my job title. Um, I lost my job in the middle of the pandemic um, in August of 2020. And... Uh, with the benefit of a, a pretty nice severance package, I traveled across the country with just my Leica M6, my Hasselblad 500CM, and I shot like 150, 200 rolls of film. And it was a transformational experience for me because I got the opportunity to do something that I never did before, which is, you know, go on a solo road trip with just me and my camera and I had no distractions. So I had a, like this unique opportunity to kind of find myself, right? And figure out the thing that I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, and, and it's been like one of the, the true greatest blessings in that you can take something that was like an absolute horrible situation, getting fired in the middle of a pandemic and then 
and learning something that I wanted to do for the best, of, you know, for the rest of my life. Um, I'm curious how you handle um, like rejection and uh, you know bad experiences in your career and how you take those negative experiences and learn from them and grow from them and how have those sort of negative experiences um, helped you become a better photographer? Well, yeah, well, first off, sorry to hear about your, your job loss. That's but okay. It sounds like it kind of, <laughs> it kind of put, it kind of put, it kind of pushed you in a new direction. Mm-hmm. Um, well, negative experiences from who, I guess, like, just like in your like, experience, guess, right? Like, it's so like you've, you've probably worked with brands in the past, who, you know, and you didn't deliver what they were asking for, or you had a bad shoot and all of your images sucked or just like really anything that you can consider like to be like a negative um, instance of your career and like, how'd you learn from it and grow from it? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess anytime it was like whatever I felt any kind of negativity, I just tried to see like what was the – was there any valid points involved in it? Because I think to 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 dismiss any negative approach to you as, you know, they don't know what they're talking about or talking shit or hating or whatever, I think that's the wrong mentality. So like I'll first like take what they're saying, you know, and like check it out and say, well, is there any – truth or is there a validness to like what what they're pointing out and um if so okay then i'll, I'll take that you know i'll note that and take it with me for the next thing um mm-hmm. if it's stuff that i don't resonate with or if it's stuff that i it, it, it that's a very broad question right because like if you're trying to work with people a lot of people are going to have different takes and different views on things mm-hmm. and some of the people who are, have these takes and views may not necessarily be the most interesting or creative people like worth taking interest from mm. like if you're kind of like just someone who got thrown into a job and you really have no love of photography, like no love of art, then I'm just like, okay, like that's fine. But like, how can I respect your opinion to a degree? Sure. But it, it, all in all, I think it's just, you know, if you have a bad shoot, if you get negative feedback, if you feel like something went wrong, just t- take a step back and self analyze. Like, why did I feel like this? Why do I think all this happened? And like, maybe it was you, maybe your vibe was off that day. Maybe your excitement or your inspiration to shoot was off that day. Maybe it's the people you're working with. There's a lot of variables. So I think it's just like analyze, take a step back and keep moving forward. I mean, like my biggest thing that I've learned is nothing in life is permanent. You know, I guess what they say is like, other than like death and taxes. So it's like, <laughs> like to sit and dwell, to sit and dwell on something like, there's no point to that keep Mm -hmm. moving fucking forward like take take note realize what it could have been or what it was and move forward like yeah to to kind of keep living in a moment it just it stalls you i agree yeah i mean i think there's uh there's a lot of negativity in and around our daily lives and you can let that sit and stew and really fuck you up or you can like learn from things file them away for next time and kind of move on um but yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I'm in a position now where I'm being told no a lot, right? So like I'm sh- trying to shoot with XYZ magazines. I'm trying to shoot with XYZ brands. I'm trying to shoot with XYZ models. And I just don't have the portfolio for it or the background or the connections, whatever it might be. Um, when you get told a lot in a creative industry, this is all new to fr- for me, it affects your confidence a lot, a lot, right? Like it's like, oh, well, am I good enough to be doing this? Am I capable of doing this? And my confidence is something that I struggle with and kind of let – ebb and flow with me on a daily basis. Um, as a person who's been in an industry for 20 years and, you know, seen a lot of highs, um, what gives you confidence? And is there anything at this point in your career that can shake your confidence? Uh, I give myself confidence and Mm -hmm. that's not like from a cocky place. That's just from like, that's what your mindset needs to be like, like early on. Right. So like, I think a friend of mine, he told me to like, you know, check out Instagram. There's this cool app. Like you should share photos on there. It'd be pretty cool to see. This was, you know, 2012 ish, I think. Um, like at first I was like, Oh, like, so am I supposed to like only post the jobs that I get to like, you know, kind of look cool or to kind of like showcase like, Hey, I'm a working photographer. But then I realized like there might be times where it's like, I might go months without like a really direct job. Mm -hmm. So I just took it into my own hands. If, if, if a company or an agency or whoever tells you like, like, no, then like, okay, cool. Like keep going or try to get that feedback from them. Like, like, what is it about it that you don't see in me right now? Like, what do you think? Like take, you know, if you're trying to get into these doors, like ask these people, like, what is it that you don't see? Like right now I want to understand so I could like maybe work on myself or work at it. Mm -hmm. So I think also too, if you're not getting the jobs and like go create your own project, like, like, 
realistically, like, what's to stop you from creating your own editorial? Oh, shit. Like, yeah. So I think if there's a concept, like for me, it's like, why wait for someone else to do it? If there's something you can pull off on your own, then fuck it. Like, go pull it off on your own and make your own editorial. Like, that's where I would, my mindset would be at, where it's kind of like, you know, if people say no, I understand that it could be disheartening and I understand they could take the wind out of the sail, but also like, okay, well, fuck it. Like, I'm going to do it myself. Do, yeah, do it myself. Like, there's plenty of creative models and makeup artists and stylists that like they're all looking for the same thing you're looking for. And it's like, well, we don't have money, but we have a fucking team of people that can make some shit. So it's mm-hmm. like, you know, if everyone down, then like we all have these photographs to share as our own little editorial pieces. So that, that'd that be my advice is like, if you're feeling no right now, keep at it. But at the same time, like if you have a project in your mind, like, oh, it'd be really cool to make a shoot like this. Why aren't you making that shoot happen? Like that, that's what I would say. Then as far as anything that, shakes my confidence um i think you know as humans we all go through phases where we do feel you know we're 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 moody creatures so it's like we might feel sad or we might feel depressed or we might feel alone Mm -hmm. and like going down that rabbit hole of like feeling these ways can easily um make you feel less than your own worth and Mm -hmm. you know so i think it's just a matter of like just try to keep yourself in a positive mind state you know, the big thing I've always been a fan of is like, always look at what you have. Don't, you know, when you focus on what you don't have, then you fucking start going through all types of fucked up emotional stress. And like, it's pointless. Right. But like, totally. look at what you do have, like, be thankful for that and realize that you do have a, a good start. And you do have a good foundation and you can make whatever you want to make from it versus like, just, you know, woe is me. I don't have this. I'm not getting this. It's like, that does nothing for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, that that's a mindset that I've been able to grab a lot. You know, since I've hit my thirties, right? You realize you don't need fifty pairs of Jordans or you know ten pairs of jeans, right? You start learning that the things that are important in our life are not stuff. It's like the people and the experiences that you share with the people in your life, like the things that are not going to be replaced or replaceable. Um, I think that's probably just something that you learn with with time, right? The amount of time that you spend on this earth, the amount of people that touch you, that's like how you kind of learn about life. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I think I'm lucky in that I'm kind of come into this creative career when it's like very easy to be inspired by other people, right? You get to see on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok, like amazing creators, you know, photographers, artists, chefs, whatever, doing and creating amazing things. Um, what inspires you? Uh, I think what inspires me, it's, it's music, um, it's just a good dialogue, a good conversation, like finding like that kind of like interviews and stuff on uh, YouTube or whatever. Um, I think life, I think just going out in life and like hearing, hearing a friend or a family members, like positive feelings and a positive story excite me and make me want to go do stuff like just energy, like just surrounding myself with the proper energy to, you know, go, go be inspired. And that's why I think with photography, it's like, I, I shoot what is kind of like grabbing me or inspiring me at that point. I don't say I'm solely this kind of photographer. Like if I'm not inspired, like walking Hollywood Boulevard, making photographs and like, I just try to pay attention to like, what is the subject matter that inspires me? Oh, it's this thing. Like, okay. Like, fuck that. I, I, I want to, I'm going to go shoot this. I'm going to follow this because like, there's something pulling me in right now. Mm-hmm. So, so I think inspiration, you know, you need to pay attention to like what truly inspires you, not what you feel like you have to do. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I think, um, I, I got away. So there was a very early on point, right. When I lost my job and I, you know, slapped on that president of John Picciuto photography, even though that's not a real place. And I said, I'm a photographer where I was just carrying my camera around with me everywhere I, I went. And I found it to be a distracting point in my life, right? Like I was having a hard time creatively because I was trying to create all the time and I didn't really give myself that leeway or that grace, you know, in, you know to, to be able to create something with intentionality. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do, do, do you experience that also? Um, do you carry a camera with you everywhere you go? Yeah. I always have something with me, but like there's plenty of days where I, I don't shoot it. I don't shoot a thing because mm-hmm. I don't, you should never force yourself or put pressure on yourself to shoot a thing. Like, you know, like, um, I think, I don't know. I think the, a lot of that I feel like comes from like social media and it's like 
pressure or feel to like constantly like output stuff to show people like, Hey, I'm doing something. I'm doing something like, look at this. Like I'm, I'm out here making this. Like, Mm -hmm. and and the reality is like, if you up your volume of output, like, like how do you control, how do you do a quality control when like you feel like your output has to be like once a day at least Mm -hmm. of like sharing a photograph and like, that's not healthy and that's not good. And I think, you know, no matter what it is, it's like, take your time with it. Like if this is what you, this is what your craft is like, there's a difference between, you know, you can go buy a chair from Ikea and then there's fucking that dude who like lives in, North, you know, upstate New York who fucking handcrafts a chair for you. That's the best quality, like all these different things. So like, that's the way I look at art or I look at creating, like you can't be a McDonald's and fucking have everything be like great. Like it's just not like, mm-hmm. so I don't know. I think if you want to be a photographer, then you want to have the title. If that's an important title, then do it. But like, I don't, you shouldn't feel compelled or pressured to like, constantly make stuff yeah i've i've thankfully been able to get away from that sort of feeling and that uh you know the pressure that social media gives you for someone like me who just doesn't have a huge social media following right for a long time i felt as if well if i don't have ten thousand instagram followers or ten thousand twitter followers like i'm not really doing it right and uh it took me having a conversation with uh, another photographer on my podcast uh jason roman um aka stock easy for him to say listen if instagram and twitter and tiktok go away to tomorrow are you still a photographer and i was like yeah of course he's like okay so stop fucking making pictures for for people on the internet like make them for you and i think that was like a a contextual point in my career and my life where i was like what's the point i was for a long time just putting things up for the sake of putting them up and there was no thought to the intentionality behind it and it was like a, a really big pivot point for me because i started having a much healthier relationship with social media yeah, and I, and I think to to add to that, I think the the number skew is is really off. Um, you know, again, if it's like you know, it got fifty likes, like fifty people for a photograph you made, that's that's a good amount of people. Like if you put fifty people in front of you, like I always, I, I'll give this analogy to people. I'm like, if you you know hung up a photo in a gallery and you saw a hundred people stopping to, to appreciate, and look at your photograph. Would you be like, okay, that's enough, everybody. This isn't enough people to look at my photograph. <laughs> Everyone leave. This is terrible. Like, yeah. I think that's so insane. Like, that, yeah. our views of numbers have totally been fucked up. And it's like, you know, or if you sold a hundred, you know, sold a hundred prints at twenty bucks a print, like, fuck, man, like, you made you made a little bit of money. Like, yeah, there, there's there's a lot of things that people really like aren't taking into consideration. And it's like you see someone, oh, I'm supposed, I should have this and I should have that, and it's like. Like, dude, just appreciate what you do have, and don't again like, appreciate what you do have, and not what you don't have. Like that, that, yeah. that mentality can really fuck with you. Well, it's also because of what social media does to us as people. It's like you start measuring yourself based on something that you can't quite describe, right? It's like you're a photographer for twenty years. How could I compare my chapter one with your chapter twenty? Right? Like it's it's like a a crazy thing to think that oh like I can ever compare myself to someone who's been doing something for ten times as long as me. But that's the toxicity that is social media. Um, I found that like with my life, like I've had a very unique, different sort of circumstances surrounding my career, working wise and and relationship wise, uh, than a lot of people that I grew up with and a lot of my friends going by. And like a lot of your life is always like planning on the next thing, right? So like when you're in high school, you got to get good grades so you can go to college and get a good job and blah, 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 white picket fence, married kids, the whole nine yards. And it's always like you're forecasting your future away. Like, where am I going to be five years from now? What more better thing is it going to be five years from now? Um, talk to me about your own experience kind of over the last 20 years in your career. Um, have you had a similar experience where you're always kind of forecasting out and looking into the future or have you been able to be extremely present, uh, in the moment as you are kind of going throughout the course of your career? Uh, I've never forecasted anything. I've, <laughs> I've, I feel like I, I really haven't. Like, I feel like I've just been present and I've been nimble. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like when I, again, like I left, I left, you know, being a producer, director, photographer in the adult industry, you know, an industry where at the time there was a stigma that like, Oh, like once you do this, you can never do anything else again. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to be tainted. You're going to be scarred. Like no one's going to fuck with you. Um, but again, I come from the mentality of like early nineties skateboarding that I came, you know, skateboarding at that time was such a subculture where there was no Red Bull, there was no Nike, no Adidas, there was no big money in skateboarding. Like I did it because 
baseball, football, team sports, none of it spoke to me. Mm -hmm. This idea of like, I ride the skateboard with other like-minded individuals and we can fully interpret the city however we want. There's no rules. Mm -hmm. Like that just completely got me. It was like, oh my God, like, like I don't have a coach telling me I have to do this, I have to do that, but rather it's up to me what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So photography to me, even though like there's people who say, if you come from this world, you can't do this. Like I come from skateboarding and it's like, well, fuck you. Like I'm going to figure out a way to do it myself. Um, I never strive to like want to be like another photographer. I just want to be myself. Mm -hmm. whenever I hear people say I want to be the next so-and-so or the next of this person like I don't understand that because it's like why don't you just want to be the first of yourself Ooh. so I just made photos that like I enjoyed making that I had fun making and was sharing them with no intention of oh I hope this is going to get me to here and from here I'm going to go to here like fuck like, that's just a lot of thinking and planning and like <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a very like, even like when I do photo shoots with models like I do no mood boards I do no inspiration photos oh me too like yeah. So, you know, I, it, it's a creative clean slate. So yeah, I don't know. I just was like always attentive to like what's going on around me and like what, what made me feel genuine, what made me feel happy and like what I was having fun doing. Like that's all I really paid attention to. It's gotten me this far. So, yeah. well, it's know, a I don't, very, I think it's done too bad. there's a high level of pragmatism to that way of thinking. I'm so glad you mentioned that about like storyboarding for like model shoots and stuff. Cause I don't do that either. Because I feel like if there's an idea beforehand, it's like then we're kind of pigeon-toed to like pigeonholed to like making that be a thing. And it's like, well, we're just recreating something that's already happened. And to me, it's like, just bring whatever you want to wear, like jeans and a t-shirt, panties, whatever you want to wear, and we'll shoot. And like, it'll just kind of evolve throughout the course of the hour, two hours or whatever when we're creating, because it's just like, you got to feel it out, right? What's the vibe? What are you feeling? What do you want to do? Versus here is the 10 photos that we looked up beforehand. Let's try to recreate that. And for someone at your level, I'm, I'm very surprised, but pleasantly to hear that that's kind of how you, you work as well. Well, I think like th there's something to what you said. I think if you have a reference photo in mind, it can fuck you up. It's kind of like um, like a subconscious like layer. Like you keep referencing that in your head, mm -hmm. or you know the model per se might want to recreate that photo. So like she's really stuck on that. I think going into something with a clear mental clean slate allows you guys to create a photograph that's more unique and true to both of you versus an inspired interpretation of something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like and I, and I, I, I live for that spontaneity and that excitement. Like I love just like okay, I don't know, like the light was falling good yesterday. We might have clouds today. We might have something else. How is this looking? Like okay, cool. Well, if it's not looking like this, then it's gonna drive me to like make it in a different way. So I, that that excitement keeps my creative brain going, like in the creation of things. Versus like if I already knew exactly where I was gonna shoot and what I was gonna shoot, like and the lighting, and everything would just be kind of boring. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I've found lately that there's a, a good, what feels like a positive, creative sort of community building happening on Twitter right now, right? Like I feel like, you know, it's mostly centered around NFT photography, which I'm not super thrilled with yet. Um, and sort of like the digital space with regards to the community building, but it feels like a, a place sort of centered in what like Instagram was when it first started, right? A collective of people kind of doing the same thing, sharing cool work. And it's easy for me to kind of get inspired by like this sort of communal creative wave that seems to be happening online. Um, and I know you and I have had some opportunities to speak in a couple of these Twitter spaces lately. Um, but I'm curious early on in your career, um, whether it was, you know, directing films, uh, working in photography, et cetera, if you had a mentor or someone that you looked up to um, at the beginning of your career? Uh, I didn't have a direct mentor, per se, in the sense of photography. Like, any photographers that like I came in contact with that were, like, seasoned and been doing it longer than me, I would just kind of, like, have conversations with them. Mm -hmm. And whatever came out of them that I found really intriguing, like, I would, like, dissect it and take the pieces that I thought were intriguing and then I would kind of mesh them all together with my view or my take and try to output something else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was never like, like exactly what they told me to do. I should do it. Like, sure. Oh, like they do this for this little bit. Okay. Well, this guy says he does this for this little bit. And you know what? I wonder what happens if those two things were to go together, but then I'm like regurgitating it through me and like my eye, like, is there a chance to do something else? Like I remember like 
early on, um, you know, when I would photograph people and models, like my favorite technique was like just to put them in front of a window and like completely like, blow out the window and like have like these like highlights kind of like wrapping around their body mm -hmm. in the imagery. And I remember a lot of people say, oh, you're not supposed to do that. Like you got to have like, you know, a flash and do all this and that. But like, for me, it was like, that's what I like doing. But, you know, it was the idea of like, you know, utilizing every place at a window frame and that window frame once like completely blown out is now this kind of blank backdrop, you know, to focus on subject matter. Mm -hmm. So that's, I don't know, it was just always like, take a little bit from the people who inspire you and mix it up inside of yourself and see what you get. Oh, totally. That's a, you bring up an interesting point because it seems to me like over the course of your career, you could say that you've been to some degree a trendsetter in sort of some of the, you know, call it lanes that you've done photography wise, whether it's aerial, street, you know, fine art, et cetera. Um, when you look at something that you've done in the past, like the aerial photography, I'm, I'm looking at a picture of Yankee Stadium that I have on my wall that you took. Um, when you look at like other people who are kind of trying to replicate that style and like that sort of thing that you've done already, is that something that like makes you laugh? Is that something that sort of like gives you a little bit of like, you know, w what is that sort of feeling like when you see someone who's kind of like basically looking at something that you did and replicating it to their sort of vision of it? Um, at, at this point, I would just kind of take it as like, that's just what people do. You know, if, if you don't have like an art school teacher, you don't have someone kind of pushing you or nudging you, like you're just going to like gravitate towards what's intriguing. And like one of the first actions is like, oh, can I do what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Or can I do like how they're doing it? Um, so I don't know. I would just feel like if that's what people want to do, that's fine. Like, because again, like, like my view of that is if I've done something enough times, and I feel like I've built a solid body of work and I've proven to myself I, I can do it. Like I'm kind of like, well, what's the next thing that I want to experiment with? Right. So by the time someone might be like onto like subject a, like I'm already on the subject C mm -hmm. because yeah. like I'm already stepping away from that or, you know, I could always revisit it, but like I've built enough up where it's like, okay, like that's cool. Like have, you know, do your thing, explore it. You know, other photographers should definitely explore whatever it is that, intrigues them but i think for me myself i just see it as like it's, it's online art school oh uh, yeah that's like what that. like all of all of this is twitter instagram like it's just a big thing of online art school because you can see other people being influenced by you know an edit that someone does on a photograph and like now all their photographs look like that guy's colors or that guy's edits or mm -hmm. the subject matter is like all similar right because it's all art class it's without a teacher mm -hmm. you know a teacher might say okay here's like winogrand or here's maplethorpe's flowers or here's all this stuff like we're going to study and try to make photographs like this the only issue is at the end of an art school semester they might say okay you learned all these different techniques I see that you can like emulate or, you know, replicate these guys works. Now I want to see something unique from you. Mm -hmm. And that's where the social media aspect is missing because there's no push for people to like truly find their, their uniqueness. It's just kind of like onto the next trending, if you want to call it that, or, you know, popular um, photo technique that everyone like feels the need that they got to conquer. They got to figure out. Yeah. Whatever the algorithm it tells you is successful to date. <laughs> Um, well, I don't, I don't know if it's the algorithm per se, but it's just a communal thing because it starts off with one person doing it, then like three people think like, oh, I want to do that, then those three people do it, then like, you know, I don't know if it's fully the algorithm per se, but I think it's just really the communal, the, the, oh, the, the real point. life, yeah, the, the real life communal algorithm, right? Because like, as you know, more people engage and like it, then more people will try it, and then it starts permeating more throughout the. Yeah, and, and, and maybe at some point it does transcend the actual algorithm because they're just saying like, "Oh, like all these likes are happening on these photographs. I guess we got to promote these photographs." Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, I think it's just really, it's really the photograph community because again, it's like you got a lot of people who are maybe between one to five, seven years into it, and they're still trying to find themselves and it's hard to find yourself, you know, with the, the complexity of social media. I do agree with that completely. I, I struggle with that mightily at this point in my career where what my voice is and what the story I'm trying to tell behind the photos and images that I create is something that I'm not sure of yet. And I think that's okay. Like, I think that's something that I'll learn about myself over time, right? Like, that's totally okay. I'm, I don't have 20 years in the game. I've got two, right? So there's a lot more for me to learn and a lot of, you know, growth for me to have. And I think that's, uh, that's a super cool point. Um, I'm curious, do you still have your Hasselblad X-Pan? 
I do. I, I have two Hasselblad X pans. Oh, I, I have my original one that I bought in 2016. Uh-huh. Um, and then Sammy's camera, like 2020, they had, I don't know who brought it in, but they had a damn near mint one, uh, an X pan two with a 45 on it. So I bought that one just as a backup because I do enjoy that camera and I know there's really not many of those out there. Yeah, I saw one on eBay the other day for ninety thousand dollars and I was laughing my ass off. Uh the reason ninety thousand or nine thousand? Ninety. Eighty nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine. Now I'm thinking it's someone's pricing that for an offer, right? Obviously no one's gonna pay that, but there's a lot of them priced at like ten thousand plus dollars. It's it's fucking insane. Not that they've actually sold at that price. But the reason why I brought that up is I'm very curious. Um, if you ever thought, or if you have gone up in a helicopter with the X-Pan, I think it would make for a pretty fucking cool photo. Uh, I, I definitely have. I've done, uh, quite a bit of stuff over LA, Miami. Um, I think just those two cities with it. Uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's, 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 it's more cinematic. It's a different yeah. way to, you know, to make photographs. Yeah. Speaking of cinematic, you've done uh, recently a number of music videos. Um, talk to me. It's sort of like coming full full circle with your career, right? You started off directing films, went full-time photographer, back into making films now and, and music videos. Um, what has that process been like for you, kind of going back into film and, and creating something in like a different uh, medium? Oh, it's like a full-on um, – it's a mind shift, right? Because like I'm – the point that I love that I really realized I loved about um, photography was it was instantaneous. I like whatever I was trying to like get across in the photograph was like, I just make the photograph and it's there and it's that that's it. It's done. There's no re-edit. There's no five edits. There's no audio corrections. It was just kind of there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, evidence a couple of years ago, he pushed me, um, you know, when I really went heavy into exploring, um, Black and white photography, um, I guess more of an artistry, kind of like recognizing, you know, shapes and with, with light and shadows. And, you know, he was just like, man, he goes, these are really interesting photographs. If you can make these move, you got a video. Mm-hmm. And so he just kept pushing me. So I got to do my first like video in some time with him. And I realized, okay, I can do this. Like I can work with someone. Like if I, especially music video wise, like if I like the music and I like them as a person, like I can do this. Like it wasn't like I'm going to go shoot videos for everybody and anybody. Now it was kind of like only select few that like I'm excited to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just exploration. Like he was down to like you know let's try Super Eight, let's try this, let's try that. And um, you know that was always really um, really fun. You know, and it. it I just looked. I just looked into it as like, well, what's the learning process now? Because it's like to make a even a music video. It's, there's a rhythm to it, and there's a whole approach to it that's not just as simple as like putting the song underneath the video and like that's it, you're done. So he, yeah. he showed me a lot of from him from a musical point of view and him as a as an artist. Like in that world, like he showed me a lot of insight to that, which was really intriguing and interesting. So you know, I might try to do more stuff. You know down the road but uh but yeah it was a really fun adventure that's pretty cool yeah i'm uh, i'm directing my very first music video in, in a few weeks with a band who uh they found me on instagram and i shot them uh at rockwood music hall in new york city you know still work and then uh they were like yeah hey listen we want to do a music video and i was like you guys know i've never done this before right and they started laughing they're like no no no, we know um but it's pretty fucking cool uh to work in sort of like an avenue that i've I've not done before and and the opportunity is like both wildly exciting and terrifying at the same time um but something that that i'm super pumped about um you've had this sort of career and the longevity in a space that's like been envious of i'm sure any sort of person in in a creative field right in photography and videography whatever you want to call it um if you were having a conversation today with someone who just decided right now to drop out of college and pick up a camera um what would be the the best piece of advice you would give to them um <laughs> That's that 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 that's a tough question. Um, I would probably say don't do it. You know, don't. <laughs> no, not 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 don't do it. I mean, like again, like that that is a question of like, well, like why are they dropping out of out of college? Like, uh, but as far as for some advice, I would just say like, you know, always always try to have fun with it. Are you always having fun with your work? Is do you ever look at like your your photography as work, or is it always? kind of like a, a positive in your life 
Uh, yeah, I never, I never treated it like work. I never said it was work. Like I was just always making photographs. Like, like, I don't know, like growing up our association with the word work, like in the sense of like a job, like that's, that's what I was escaping. Mm-hmm. Um, so I never wanted to like refer to that. And I think it's a special thing. I think if you find like an art or creative outlet, like to call it work is so, st- it's so, it's so it's like, it's just so sterile. It's like yeah, limiting. Like, yeah. Is it like, is it really like work? Like that's like, yeah, like disgusting. It's like a bad taste in your mouth. Like, so I don't, I, I never tried to approach it like that. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people who kind of came up in the skate world in the nineties, maybe not a lot, but like better than 50% average have had the benefit of like exceptionally great careers, whether it was straight and straight in skateboarding, um, or whether they branched out into creating a brand or creative pursuit, whatever. Um, was there something about, I don't know, maybe work ethic instilled or something that transpired at a young age um, and growing up in kind of that outside culture that has positively impacted you like throughout life? Like, is, is there something that you learn at a young age through those groups of people and those friends in that community um, that you think can kind of sort of correlate to the success that you had in your other careers? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll attribute it all pretty much to skateboarding. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like, you find a trick that you want to do and you wreck your brain and your body, like everything, like till you fucking get it done Yeah, and you figure out how to get it done. Mm -hmm. Um, all that, all that mentality, all that's from skateboarding. That's why, like, you know, you're saying like a lot of skateboarders, you know, people from skateboarding have been successful because like, once you learn this, you learn a do it yourself mentality. You learn that it's all on you that, you know, you learn to never take no for an answer. Or, you know, if somebody says like, Oh, like you suck, like, you learn to say, fuck you, I'm going to fucking go forward and do it. These are all character builder things that like can push you into a better place. You know, if everything is like, I don't know, like that, that's just the best takeaway I can, I can say is that skateboarding instilled all of these fucking things. Like, cause it wasn't just yourself beating yourself up to get the trick done. And it wasn't just like, you know, other skateboarders that you didn't vibe with, like talking shit. Mm-hmm. It was also like society's outlook on skateboarding at that time. Like, like, oh, you skateboard ill, you're dirty, ill, you're gross, like all these fucking things, right? So it's like, it wasn't just yourself and peers, it was also society's take on skateboarding and like everything kind of against you. So like when you kind of come up and you spend, you know, years of your, your evol- you know, uh, developing life with all this, like you got to be thick skinned, like you got to fucking deal with it and you got to push through it. Like that's just what skateboarding is all about is pushing through any – hardships that come your way and like once you get that instilled with you like that's the best thing is because now you can go be a fucking stockbroker you could be a fucking photographer you could be whatever you want because you've already come up with like this boot camp training of like what happens when someone tells you no well i'll fucking do it anyway mm-hmm. like yeah so that yeah fuck all that mentality. stuff for sure yeah i uh... yeah i mean you know and, and i and i see like I, it's interesting because I, I keep hearing about like the participation uh trophy generation oh god yeah we're like you know, and I, I feel like that's what I see a lot of it at, where it's like, you know, if you feel like your photos should be here, if you feel like just for the sake of feeling it, like you should be making all this money, like, like, dude, like that's not how the fucking world works. If you don't get into a gallery, it's like, you know, you can't get mad and say, oh, they're just hating on me. They don't like my work. It's like, <laughs> nah, like, dude, like you got to push through, like, you know, like yeah. fucking show them, show them what's up. I mean, I, I've, I, I'm a, a, a direct sort of byproduct of that. Like I, I took a career making high six figures in, you know, construction and, and uh, finance and just said, fuck this shit. This is not, this, these things aren't important to me. Like I don't need more money. I don't need more stuff. Like I want to have a life that is, you know, filled with creative joy and like doing the thing that I love to do. Like I literally have said, like, I don't care how much money I make over the course of this two year period. I'll do work for free. I'll, you know, be someone's assistant for free. I'll fly somewhere to work with someone for $5. I mean, I just want the experience, the opportunity to learn and grow. And that's not going to happen with this generation of kids who have grown up with participation trophies for sure. Um, I think in direct relation to that sort of skateboarding community like I've been lucky enough to have like the support of my family and my friends in a way that you know you you, you can only describe it as blessed I'm super curious about what your support system was like in from the beginning of your career to now and uh, how that relationship with your family and friends has been able to benefit you from a from a production perspective um 
I mean, yeah, like early on, I was fortunate to have a lot of friends that were very like um, supportive and, and pushing. I mean, that's a, a big reason why like I really started doing more photography was, you know, I would have like close friends that would see some photographs and be like, oh, like these are really cool pictures. Like that kind of sparked my idea of like, oh, like maybe I can make pictures. Um, you know, and family wise, I think family, no matter what, like they just want to see you be happy, you know, doing something that you love doing and being happy doing it. Mm-hmm. Like, so his family is always going to, usually is always going to be supportive. And especially like where I was coming from, like they were just like, yeah, like if you, you know, like you want to explore this, go do this. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I was, I was fortunate just to have like some great people in my corner that kind of like just nudged me, you know, and like gave me, you know, positive reinforcements when they felt they were deserving. You know, if I made a certain photograph, like this is a good picture, like, you know, all this different stuff. So that kind of good, but then it's also like learning to like, build up your own, you know, um, your own positive reinforcement of yourself, which is like a big thing, like versus like looking for everybody else. Like it's okay to like build yourself up and like be positive towards yourself. Like totally. it doesn't always have to be like an audience or an outside group of people telling you you're great. Like you can tell yourself you're great and just, you know, within limits and like, mm-hmm. like be it. You know? Yeah. I love that. I- I'm a firm believer in manifesting, you know, the things that you want out of life. And to some extent, I'm reaping that benefit in this conversation right here, for sure. Um, you, you've had this fucking amazing ability to create beautiful works of art. You have 20 years of experience. You've worked with some amazing human beings in film, in modeling, in arts, whatever. Um, do you still suffer with imposter syndrome at all? Uh, no, because I don't worry about too much what other people think of me. Hmm. I like that. I guess. You know what I'm saying? Because it's yeah. like, if you, like, I don't know, like, Fuck again, it. like, I, I try I try to direct my energy and my thoughts and so, like, stuff that's, like, you know, it's just better energy. Because, again, like, if you, like, going down a rabbit hole, if you started, am I good enough? Am I this and that? Like, like to self-doubt, it's like, while we all have been there, we all can kind of go through it. Like, once you do go through it, you know, a couple times, it's like, like this does nothing for me mm-hmm. like sitting here and doubting myself and questioning myself does nothing for me and it's like hey like I'll, I'll keep making work and keep putting the work out there and like if people like it cool if not like i'm still gonna like do it like um yeah i love that i yeah i don't know it's it's it's, it's a thing again like i've gone through it. i've had my moments where it's like am i still good or is this a thing but then it's just like well like what's the point of it like like you just try. I'm still having it. fun. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just still having fun making these pictures. So it's like I'm going to keep making these pictures and like, you know, and see and see what happens. Yeah, I like to spend the last bit of every podcast doing sort of a rapid fire Q and A. Um, some are easy, some are a little bit more in depth. First thing that comes to mind, or first couple. But my first question for you is, what's your favorite book? Um, my favorite book. I'm blanking out on the name of the author. Uh, it's the art of happiness. Oh yeah. Yeah. I read that. What's your favorite movie? Uh, kids. Oh, nice. Uh, favorite food. Um, dude, I was like so much, so much. I mean, I would say probably off the top of my head, uh, Koji barbecue truck. Uh, that seems like recency bias, Steven. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I, 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 just, I, just, I just had it. Like, that's like still been on my mind. So, I saw it on like, your yeah, story the other day. I was like, oh, fuck. So jealous. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you believe in an afterlife? Uh, I believe there is some form of an afterlife, not a specific one. Yeah, I agree. You know what I find reassuring? I've, I've asked that question 60 plus times now, and I think we're like at 90% people thinking there's something else beyond, and that's a bit reassuring. Um, what's your biggest dream? Uh, happiness for myself, happiness for my family. Oh, I love that. Uh, what's the best piece of advice someone's ever given you? Uh, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate in, in the sense of business. Hmm. Yeah. I like that. Are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. Nice. Last question. What's one recommendation for something that you've consumed lately? It could be a podcast, a movie, a book, a TV show, just something that you've watched or consumed lately that you think everyone should check out. Oof, man. It's like we watch so much material now that it's like it should be fucking like top of the, the list. 
I've been, I don't know. I'm going to keep it simple. I've been really, I've been enjoying a uh, peacemaker series. Oh dude. HBO. It's so good. It's one of those shows that's like so absurdly hilarious, but it's just, I mean, John Cena was meant to play that role. So good. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like that, that would be my thing. It's like, if you just want like a break from something and want to laugh, like, you know, go check that out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, Stefan, uh, I, I mean, I can't be more effusive of for who you are as a person and, and how much your work has meant to me as an individual. I am beyond appreciative for uh, the time that you gave me today for, to be on this podcast. It's been really surreal and fucking awesome for me. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Not for sure, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Be well. <laughs>